Andrea, can you hear us? Loud and clear. Excellent. Good morning. Uh, you've got, uh, we've got some people here. We've got some people uh, who will be joining online uh, very shortly. Uh, but I think in the interest of time, uh, I'd like you to go, go ahead. We're obviously delighted to welcome our friend and colleague, Andrea De Domenico, who is uh, the head of OCHA for the Occupied Palestinian Territory, who is briefing us from Jerusalem, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, to give us an update on the situation there and also on some new uh, population estimates that will come out today. So, Andrea, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan, and good morning, everybody. Um, I will start saying that, you know, here we are again um, at the crossroad where the UN nation, United Nations and its partner has to reset their operations. Uh, you might have seen that uh, the latest information from Gaza with uh, an evacuation order that has impacted uh, a third of the, the strip, 117 square kilometers, uh, much less impactful in terms of the people because, of course, uh, unfortunately, people are already uh, concentrated in other areas and, and some of the areas covered by the evacuation orders are uh, indeed have been already either subject to previous evacuation order or uh, fighting that has happened in the previous months. So the population has already left. But what we saw uh, the last two days uh, since uh, Monday afternoon when the evacuation order was issued, uh, we have seen a constant flow of people moving out. We estimated that up to 250,000 people could be affected by this evacuation order. Um, but we are trying to, uh, you know, monitor, and it's very difficult for us to be on the ground in all places, trying to monitor the different patterns and be more precise in terms of the number of people that currently are moving. And that leads me to the point uh, on uh, on the on the overall situation of and, and the numbers around populations that we wanted to to brief you about today. At the moment, we estimate that, that nine of uh, every 10 people in Gaza Strip have been internally displaced at least once, uh, if not up to 10 times, unfortunately, since October. Um, and, and, you know, I was speaking with colleagues that we have recently uh, recruited to, to scale up our operations, and they were telling me themselves that they have been with their family moving you know, nine, 10 times. You know, a few times in the north, a few times in the, in Khan Yunis, then go back to Rafa, now up again to Khan Yunis in their Bala. So it's a constant uh, uh, movement. We were looking at the the uh, projections of the overall uh, population data that uh, the Palestinian uh, Center of Statistics, uh, Bureau of Statistics, is is publishing based on the natural growth of the population in Gaza. And that was situating the overall population in Gaza at 2.3 million people, roughly. It's a bit less than 2.3 in reality. Um, then we, we, we thought that um, now nine months into this, uh, in this crisis, we had to look into some numbers that are the only safe numbers and, and known numbers that we have. That includes uh, the 110,000 people that have been able to exit Gaza according to the border authority and, and the recordings of, the, of those movements since, uh, since uh, October. Uh, we also uh, have to take into account the 37,000 people that have been killed, more than uh, 37,000 people that have been killed according to the Ministry of Health. And so based on, on these two fundamental data, um, in consultation with the partners in Gaza, and for the sole purpose of humanitarian programming, uh, so it doesn't preclude the ability and the possibility and the day in which uh, the, those who have left Gaza uh, will, will uh, possibly come back into Gaza. But just for our programming purposes uh, as, as humanitarian community, we estimate that the population present in Gaza comprises about 2.1 million people. Um, and we have said since the, 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 the beginning of the war uh, that basically 
all of them, unfortunately, are in need of assistance. Out of the current Gaza population, we also estimate that 1.9 million are internally displaced multiple times. So, for example, the patterns of movement that we have registered in the last two days, uh, they are not necessarily adding to this number because some of those, or many of those, were already displaced. Uh, and, so, and then they moved in, in, other, in, in different areas, and now they are moving again, uh, trying to find a safe, uh, a safe space, if there is any of such. Before we were estimating 1.7, but be, remember, since that number, we had the, the Operation Rafa, so we had additional displacement from Rafa, and Rafa was not one of the areas that uh, originally uh, was was displaced, uh, so the residents of Rafa. Um, and then we had also operations in uh, in the north um, that has also moved people, uh, particularly the Jab Jabalia area, and then in recent days also the Sujahia area, where we had uh, new displacement, but again, those were people that were already displaced in the past, and they have been moving back and forth into their areas. Um, and, and just to be very clear, this is not the result of a census or, or a survey. Uh, this just represents the, the uh, sort of a dynamic that we produce based on several uh, sources, uh, uh, including you know internet usage, mobile phone usage, uh, and trying also to cross check with with colleagues on the ground when this this is possible. But beyond these numbers, uh, there, are, there are people, of course, men, women, boys and girls, uh, doctors, students, uh, cooks, artists, journalists, teachers, uh, moms, dads, um, and people that have fears and grievances. Um, and they had probably dreams and hopes, the less and less I fear today, unfortunately. Um, people who in the last nine months have been moved around like homes in a board game, forced from, from one location to the next location to the next location to the next location, irrespective of our ability of support them and irrespective of the availability of services wherever they land. Um, they have to, they've been forced to move uh, because of the patterns of the war. Heavy fighting uh, that has, uh, of course, impacted them uh, whenever they took the risk to stay where they, their houses were or their, where their tents and huts and, and, and makeshift uh, shelter was built up. Um, and, and they move in an overcrowded area. What we're seeing, unfortunately, is a patterns that more and more resemble and go back to the originally identified area where uh, the government of Israel and the IDF told us that they want to concentrate all the people. And that's what the patterns that we consistently see unfolding in front of our eyes. Um, with some people remaining in the north, out of this 2.1 million people, we estimate that 300, 350,000 are in the north. And those cannot come to the south. Uh, the, the, the strip is completely broken in two uh, as of today. Uh, there are, you know, military presence that is blocking movements and impeding movements uh, for the civilians, and frequently, unfortunately, also obstructing our ability to move. These people have been forced to completely reset their lives over and over again. I was talking with some people that moved uh, uh, again after the Rafa operation, and they were telling me, you know, it, it's very difficult for us to you know, over and over again, restart the learning of where we are uh, and how we can access basic services. You know, after a while in this makeshift shelter or tent that they had, they, they figure out where the food could be found, where the water could be found, where the potable water could be found, where the medical point was. And, and they start getting acquainted with their neighbors if they don't have the family with them. And that is you know, stripped apart again and again and again. And people have to reinvent and their ability to cope uh, with, with, with conditional lives that are beyond imaginable. Um, 
in the recent days, we have seen displaced people uh, moving once again from places like Sujahia, for example. Um, and, and even the, the, the so-called or the unilaterally declared zone has been targeted uh, by, by military operations and forcing people uh, again to, to leave the areas. Um, many UN offices and, and NGO offices were along the Mawasi area in Rafa, so uh, in the south, in front of the sea. Um, and, uh, and people look at us as a parameter or barometer of the situations, and if they see that we move out uh, from, from those areas, they, they fear that something is happening. What we've seen is the, the Rafa operation uh, progressively move toward the sea and progressively approach uh, uh, the, the, the safe zone, again, the, the unilaterally declared safe zone, and fighting has been happening there. Uh, and, and of course, this is carrying people out, uh, and, and many have packed the little, uh, the little belongings that they had to move. Um, others look at us and see if we're still there, it means that they maybe are uh, safe staying there. Uh, we calculate that around our area there were probably 80,000 people, uh, and we colleagues were telling me that they were estimating that. 20%, 25% of the people around our offices have been moving while others are still hanging in there because they know that there is not uh, much space to move to. This war has also been and continues to be characterized by several obstructions. Um, of course, it continues generating more pain and suffering and more humanitarian needs. You know, people need water, food, shelter, healthcare, hygiene, uh, protection, <clears throat> and uh, and we struggle to deliver this. We, you know, there has been in the recent days, uh, our USG, as as uh, Mr. Griffith has has repeated again, we are there to uh, to stay and deliver and to help people, but delivering for us is a daily struggle. Literally, we have to, you know, make gigantic efforts to to sustain some lifelining uh, of our services. You know, the delivery of fuel, one thing, fuel is, why would that be so important? But fuel uh, allows hospitals to, to continue providing services, life-saving, life-sustaining services in hospitals. Uh, fuel allows water to be, uh, you know, desalinized uh, and, 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 and provide basically drinking water to people. Uh, fuel allow us uh, to move food around uh, and, and bring to the multiple number of NGOs that are, you know, cooking in, in tequias and offering food and, and meals to, to, to people that is desperate in need. Um, just like the displaced people, our monitoring operation is subject to continuously reset you know, before the war, our humanitarian hub was in Gaza City, in the north. Um, then you might remember, the night between the 11th and 12th of October, in the middle of the night, the Israeli Authority ordered us to abandon uh, those facilities and move south. We had to comply to protect uh, the lives of our staff, leaving behind warehouse supplies, vehicles, equipment, uh, and bring with us whatever we could, you know, grabbing those things, you know, in between bombardment that was unfolding all around. Uh, we left with a feeling of, of guilt uh, because we knew that we were leaving behind civilians. And since then, we have been quite determined to, you know, not being pushed every time uh, by the conditions to, to, to move unless really the safety becomes into, comes into line. And in that case, of course, we have to, to make sure that our colleagues stay safe. But we really need to, to draw a line of you know, enough for, for, for the people, enough for this war that keeps on tearing apart the life of people. We were forced to reestablish our entire monetary mechanism from scratch in the South identifying new facilities, finding new staff, uh, or, or helping our colleagues to come back to work because they were all traumatized, all have lost you know, their, their homes, their, many have lost their family members, uh, and it was a difficult journey. 
Um, and and we did it. Uh, but then again, was the you know part of the operation at some point were based on on Han Yunis and then Rafa. And then how Unis operation came in. And again, we had to reinvent our uh, footprint and our operations. And today, our hub was in Rafa. Again, uh, it's gone. Uh, and and they're, you know, the, the military operation are pushing again and flipping again completely the table. In the last weeks, we have been discussing a lot with the, with, with, uh, with the Israeli and, and the humanitarian community how to resume our ability to uh, to bring assistance in from Khan and Abu Salem, so inside Gaza, and distribute throughout the Strip. And we have been engineering a lot of solutions and trying and testing and proving and, and failing at times. And, uh, and now, with this evacuation order, all this has been again uh, wiped out. By the way, as of yesterday, with, with the, um, the Monday evacuation order, uh, the Gaza European hospital has been impacted. Yesterday we were busy in evacuating the patients remaining in the Gaza hospitals, but in the meantime, many, including patients, doctors, nurses, staff, have left already on Monday. Um, and then late in the evening, the Israeli said, but we did not intend to evacuate the hospital or ask the evacuation of the hospitals. But um, first of all, they, they didn't tell us, uh, they didn't communicate this to, to people, but then, when they told us people have the memories of what has happened in Shifa, in Nasser, in other hospitals, where you know doctors and patients and, and nurses were, you know, once the hospital was uh, uh, invaded by the, the IDF, they were arrested, uh, interrogated. Some of them uh, then were found days after into into mass graves. So people is uh, fear. Uh, the fear is. Is dominant, and so people have left. And with the uh, with the loss of of the European Gaza Hospital, we lost one of the last hospitals that has some fundamental services. It had the last CT scan available, fully functioning, was in in in, in that hospital. This is gone. Um, will we be able to reestablish somewhere some some something similar? I hope so. But again, we have to restart. And we have to, you know, in, in a very challenging environment. Um, some of the concrete other structures that we, I think, is important to, to, to mention. Electricity and fuel. Israeli authority, if you remember, they cut off electricity in, in October. Uh, and since then, of course, there has not been electricity. So electricity is fundamentally provided and solely provided by other solar panels. Um, but that works only during the day because there are not many batteries left. And, or fuel through generators. Uh, but fuel import, as you remember also, has been initially banned and now heavily controlled. But even to import that, we need a functioning Karim Shalom, Karim Abu Salem, and an ability to bring them the fuel where it is needed. It's just not to let him in. It's also allowing this fuel to be distributed where it is uh, it is needed. Without power, uh, water becomes scarce, bakeries cannot operate, baby incubators are turned off in hospitals, and ambulances remain grounded. Not to mention the fact that many ambulances, unfortunately, have been, have been hit during this nine months of war. Um, safety and access has been always a, a concern for us, uh, for our staff, for our personnel. Uh, and, and, and for the civilians that are caught in, in, in the fighting. Uh, nowhere and no one is safe in Gaza. Uh, we keep on saying this. We have seen over and over, you know, uh, military operation and bombardment happening also in the, uh, the heart of the humanitarian safe zone, unilaterally declared by Israel. Uh, 274 workers and volunteers, our colleagues, my colleagues, have been killed so far. You know, um, and many of them were killed on duty. Uh, Others were killed at home with their families and their family members. Um, they risk their life every day, um, and uh, and there is no humanitarian installation that has been, or very rare humanitarian installation that have been uh, spared when the front line moves. Um, so despite our effort of you know, notifying those locations, the reality of the battle on the ground that it is 
frequently those those places are hit. You have seen the incidents affecting, uh, you know, WFP, uh, UNRWA many many times, uh, and and other uh, NGO colleagues and and, and other NGO entity. The insecurity of humanitarian worker is uh, closely related to, um, and unfortunately accompanied by uh, those uh, campaigns that call aid organization to question for inability to deliver. Uh, we have a dialogue with Israeli daily, uh, literally multiple times a day, actually. And we explain our challenges. We try to find solutions. We work out understanding that, of course, you know, war is war and, and it might have his, his logic and his uh, objectives. But, you know, humanitarian assistance is an obligation that all the parties have to respect. Israeli and other armed groups. And we keep on calling them all to help us to deliver the assistance that is so dearly needed to, desperately needed to, uh, to Palestinians. Humanitarian locations and movement um, are, are, of course, uh, an effort. Uh, we do a lot of effort to notify uh, to the fighting uh, parties um, in order to um, protect them but also protect our colleagues, I mean, but also because it's a way for the parties to fulfill their obligations. You know, our role is helping the parties to fulfill their obligations. And so I really hope that we can, you know, continue this dialogue, building more trust among, among our, uh, the, the parties um, in order to be able to serve people because the condition of people are degrading day by day. Um, you have seen that the the uh, recent uh, uh, integrated uh, phase classification that is, you know, fundamentally telling us that 96% of the population in Gaza, 96%, is from emergency uh, food insecurity or catastrophic food insecurity status. Uh, this is simply unacceptable. We, we we need to move the dial on this. And this is not only about bringing food. It, it is about health. It is about uh, uh, water. It is about sanitation. We have a growing problem uh, in, of, of sanitation. We cannot pick up uh, garbage and bring it to the, the landfill because the landfill are not accessible. Um, and we keep on insisting day in, day out. Um, uh, finally, the last point, uh, and I wrap up. Um, we have made an appeal for 3.4 billion uh, for, uh, for the response in Gaza. Uh, as of now, we have only 35% uh, covered. And you might tell me, but you're describing so many challenges uh, to, to deliver, so why would you appeal for more money? The reality is that if um, if we will be able to reach the, the situation where a ceasefire will be called or even opposed, we will not be able to scale up all our operation to the level necessary unless those resources are mobilized. So it is absolutely important to invest and mobilize those resources now to make sure that when this will happen, we'll be able to scale up. And in the meantime, we'll spare no effort day in, day out to increase our ability to deliver, stay and remain in protected civilians. Thank you for the time you have given. Thank you that. very much, Edie. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Andrea. On behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing, my name is Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Um, a couple of follow-up questions. <clears throat> Um, for the people moving out of Khan Yunus, um, do you have any numbers of how many have actually left and where are they going? And secondly, um, Sigrid Cog said yesterday that one of the key issues is uh, for the delivery of aid within Gaza is deconfliction. Are you making any progress on deconfliction with the Israelis? And can you give us an update on 
what actually is getting through within Gaza and um, how important criminali criminality remains. Thank you. Go one ahead, by one, Seth. Yeah, go ahead, okay. please. Thank you. Yeah. So um, people moving from Khan Yunis, first of all, uh, is, uh, you know, the, the eastern part of Khan Yunis uh, is affected. And there is then some areas uh, next to the city center that, uh, again, uh, have been uh, receiving evacuation orders. As I said, because of all the multiple, the patterns of multiple displacement, it's very difficult to have a precise number about those areas. We estimated, uh, based on, on the latest uh, analysis done, that in all the areas, so the, the entire eastern part of Khan Yunis and Derbala and Rafa, we, we were estimating 250,000 people. We will need to go back on the ground and check um, you know, how many of those have, have first moved and where they are going. Where they are going, basically they are going in the Mawasi area of uh, Khan Yunis and Derbala. So they are going toward the sea which is uh, an absolutely overcrowded area, first of all, with very, very limited services. There is no water, not enough water, not enough, uh, um, there are no toilets there, there and, and even bringing food there is, is a major, is a major uh, challenge for us. Um, it is true that the deconfliction, actually we call it, uh, uh, Ida, we call it the humanitarian notification system because the deconfliction is the way that the military adapt and respond and manage those information. So the humanitarian notification system in se works. What is not working is the deconfliction element because we have seen over and over again situations where uh, areas that, uh, premises that were supposed to be deconflicted were not deconflicted at the end and have been hit. At times by ricochet or, or you know, a straight bullet, but at times they were targeted. Um, you know, the, the recent incident, for example, in, in early, uh, I think it was early May, um, that uh, impacted the WFP uh, twice uh, in, in, a, I mean, in two different locations in a matter of a few days. Uh, there were houses in Hayunis and Derbala uh, got hit. So it is really important. I know that uh, our colleagues from the uh, UNDSS are uh, engaging uh, a dialogue with uh, with the Israeli authorities just to make sure that we strengthen uh, further the, the mechanisms. I think that there is um, there is there has been always a dialogue, and then there is the will to move a little bit the dial on on, on that. Um, but you know what is important is that it trickles down in terms of concrete action on the ground, and I'm looking forward to it. And what is coming in? Uh, so at the moment, we bring in material from Zikim, so the, the it's Eretz West. west. Um, that's an important piece of the operation because it's primarily allowing us to uh, meet uh, the basic needs, the basic needs in, um, in the north. Uh, in the south, in the last uh, uh, four weeks, it has been very problematic and partially uh, as you alluded to, is because of the, of the internal criminality uh, and linked to the, the, the smuggling of, of, uh, of cigarettes. Um, and that has become a little bit the, the biggest challenge we had. We tried to find, you know, logistical solutions, um, but you understand that the real problem is a political problem. The real, there is no logistical solution to a political problem, which resonates with the lack of law and order. And that's something that the parties have to, to be engaged further. Thank you. Thank you. Maggie, then Mike, then Michelle. Then we'll... Andrea, it's uh, Margaret Bashir with VOA. Thank you so much for sharing your precious uh, time with us today. Uh, just some more follow-ups, please. Uh, Al Mawasi, how many people can it feasibly accommodate in, in that area, and how many do you estimate are there? You, you gave a figure of 80,000, but I'm not quite sure if that's al Mawasi or not. And then uh, the people who are moving from the new evacuation zones towards the coast, um, are the IDF on those roads? Are we seeing uh, people being detained or arrested, men being pulled out of those uh, groups of families that are moving? Any Because we've seen that in previous uh, evacuations. So I just wanted to 
uh, find out what's going on with this one. And are the humanitarians present on the road to hand out water, to give out high energy biscuits, to assist people that are on the move? Thank you. So um, the Amawasi area that I was referring at is the Amawasi area in Rafa. Uh, so it's really the southern, north southern part. And that's where the, we were estimating that uh, uh, we had the, you know, 80,000 uh, remaining people. The Mawasi area um, expand to into Khan Yunis and, and Derbala. And that's the area where, um, as I said earlier, the, 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 the original intentions uh, declared by, by the, the government of Israel was to concentrate all the po civilian population and consider that a safe area. Now, uh, two elements. I think that in the south now, we estimate roughly, given the numbers that I gave you before, that between that around 1.8 million people are in, in, in the southern part. And the majority of those today are concentrated in Derbala city and the Mawasi area. Now, it's very difficult for me to tell you how many um, uh, are, are exactly in the Mawasi area uh, as per the definition of the, the, the Israeli. Um, what I can tell you is that it's by far overcrowded. Um, there is no moment in the day where you can drive through that area or move in that area without finding you know, thousands and thousands of people that are on the streets and, and, uh, and, and, and there are you know, a lot of small activities going on. There is markets, mushrooming, trying to, to sell the little things that enter into the, the street. Uh, but is by far overwhelmed and 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 most importantly lack the basic services. We did not see yet uh, ground uh, troops on the on the ground. Um, we had um, uh, the likes that you were referring at it before, because uh, the, the the episode you had in mind where when the the troops were already on the ground, uh, at least in the area that has been object of the evacuation order issue on Monday afternoon. Uh, where we saw uh, troops on the ground was in the southern part of Mawasi, in Rafa Mawasi, um, and is part of the uh, the, the Rafa operations. Um, we have not been uh, witnessing any kind of checkpoint because uh, or, or you know situations where men have been separated from women and screened and and like that. Uh, that has not, uh, to to my knowledge, been reported. Um, because it was more an engagement with the militants on the ground in the same area um, and, and was tit for tat and battle uh, fought between uh, those groups. Thank you. Uh, Mike and then Michelle. Thanks, Steph. Thank you, sir, for doing this briefing. It's appreciated. Um, I wanted to clarify, you said toward the top that uh, approximately 110,000 Gazans have exited the enclave. Can you give a little bit more detail as to by what method they've done so, where they've gone, for what specific reasons they were able to get out. And on a broader note, um, forgive me if I'm wrong, I hadn't heard uh, Hamas mentioned as of yet. There's obviously this huge uh, argument going on as to whose responsibility falls under, you know, whose purview. Where does Israel's responsibility in terms of the deliverance of humanitarian aid end, and where does Hamas's begin? Can you kind of clarify where that line is? Thank you. You're, you're muted. Sorry. The 110,000 um, are uh, Gazawi that have left uh, the street basically since uh, uh, end of October, beginning of November, uh, until the Rafa operation has started in uh, in early May, in the 7th of um, some, uh, you know, if you remember the beginning, uh, the, 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 the exit was, uh, uh, was there were still authorities at the crossing, and so there was not clarity about the methods to cross, if they were paying or not, basically. Um, and then the more and more there has been a movement of people that has been uh, uh, basically paying out their, 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 their way. Uh, there was a, a, you know, a facilitated, uh, a, a, there was an, a company that was facilitating these exits. And, and this number, are, as I said, have been reported by the crossing authorities combining um, the, the, the information with the Egyptian side. Um, so 
where their whereabouts, um, you know, some have remained in Egypt uh, and some have, have left Egypt. Um, it's not uh, my office uh, responsibility and, and prerogative to follow that uh, that flows, um, and so I cannot tell you exactly how they've been uh, moving and how many are remaining in uh, in in Egypt. Um, if you have listened to me with the Yamas uh, question, if you have listened to me carefully, I am always saying the parties, because I think that all the parties have a responsibility to meet the the fundamental responsibility of protecting uh, civilians. Um, you know, of course, uh, the parties have not the same. Uh, that, that you cannot equate them. You know, the, the strength and, and the and the means. Uh, of, of the of the forces on the ground are very different, uh, but of course both contributed to the the suffering and the pain we have seen uh, in, on the ground, and we constantly call them all to meet their responsibilities. That includes, for example, not using inappropriately any civilian infrastructure, particularly hospitals. That is a very debated question. The point is that we have never been able to establish with independent. Uh, uh, staff or personnel of the UN, uh, the claims of, of the one or the other party. So, you know, I, I don't really know. I can tell you if they have been misusing hospitals or not. What I know is that the result of it has always been impacting hospitals, which by now are, you know, I think we have, to, as of today, 20 hospitals that are not functioning out of, of 36, and the remaining one are partially functioning and, and barely receiving what they need. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, then to some. Thanks, Andrea. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Um, a quick follow-up on, you mentioned how there'd been a lot of discussions over the past few weeks on how to better improve the delivery of aid from Krem Shalom into Gaza and how that's all been wiped out now with this new evacuation order. Can you just explain that a little bit more to us? Is that because warehouses are in the evacuation order, you can't reach the people because they've now moved? If you could just explain that. And then um, Rafa is still closed. What options are being discussed for the possible reopening of Rafa? And then there is a report this morning that the UN's discussing with Israel the possible use of Starlink in Gaza. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, um, but maybe you could tell us how Starlink might be um, of use for aid operations in Gaza. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. So. Khan Yunis, if you remember, um, sorry, Khan Yunis, uh, Karen Shalom, um, if you remember, the, uh, the, the, until the operation in Rafah started, our, the backbone of our humanitarian operation was an entry of commodities from Egypt uh, into Karen Shalom, the scanning, drop off in Karen Mabu Salem, and then we could pick them up, bring them to Rafah, where we had our log base, uh, and from there dispatching further throughout the, the Gaza Strip. Um, when the military operation started in Rafa, of course, we lost the, the, the ability to use those areas. We used them for another, we used the area more or less as a as a corridor actually only for a week, and then and then an alternate road was built by the Israeli uh, in order to make sure that we could continue to operate uh, the the Karim Abu Salem um, north of the airport, and so the road cuts north of the airport and intercept the Salahadin uh, street. The problem is that with the Operation Rafa, we lost our warehouses, we lost our fuel sto storage, uh, and we lost our, our ability to, you know, transload the aid that is coming from Karma Salem and then dispatch it further. So we tried to, to find solutions and we you know, explore alternative roads, we explore different options to, to move to the north and to the middle area um, and, and find alternative locations where we could drop the, 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 the material, the commodities, the aid, uh, in, pick it up from Karamusal and drop it close and then from there, so being able to do back and forth quickly in order to use all the material that has been dropped in Karim Abu Salem, and then from there dispatch further. The order, the evacuation order, is covering uh, all the areas where all this alternate roads, alternate warehousing capacity, transloading new new locations for, for us to start the operation were planned to be. 
and we were working literally as you know as, as uh, until <laughs> Monday we were working on it. Now we have to see what is the implication, the impact on on those. I hope that we can find uh, an, an agreement that, that those areas will be protected and not, uh, you know, uh, hit by by the, the the military operation that could unfold in the coming hours, and then possibly restart our humanitarian operations. You know, we have no problem to operate whoever is in control of the area as long as we have uh, guarantees of safety and and security. Um, on the communication equipment, the communication equipment has been a long-standing request of the humanitarian community as a whole. We do it on behalf of our entire community, so including our partners. Um, and, and it is very simple, you know, every time there is a military operation, we lose completely communication uh, with our teams. Uh, you know very well, and you see me now, uh, you know, the internet and connectivity is fundamental to the way we operate and function in these days um, and and also the simple uh, phone connections are, are fundamental uh, so when there are military operation frequently the the coverage of mobile phone goes down hence we need alternative ways to communicate with our teams in order to organize the day-to-day -day operations Yesterday night, I was until 11 o'clock talking to the team to reorganize our plan for today uh, because we, we were forced to replan the entire day uh, uh, for, for the unfolding events in, on the ground. And, you know, unless I can communicate with my team, I cannot do the coordination essential between them, uh, the, all the partners on the ground, and the military uh, the Israeli military to make sure that they can safely do this operation. So, I, I, you know, would it be Starlink? Would it be another technology? I don't really care as long as we have what we need to communicate safely with our with our teams for safety and for operations. Thank you, Ibtisa. And there was just uh, options for reopening Rafa. Huh. Sorry, I was hoping to dodge it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nice try. Uh, so, <laughs> um, the, so we have always said that for us is important the, the reopening of Rafa, particularly uh, and uh, for, for the private sector. We have always been saying that the private sector is equally important are the humanitarian operations. So we have to prioritize the humanitarian aid because I think we have some, uh, we have the ability and the interest to prioritize the most needy people. And, and we are not only looking for, for the commercial aspect of, the, of our action, we have not commercial interest on that. But we need to be complemented with private sector. So we have always said that the RAFA is fundamental. Um, again, it's a, it's a political issue and it is uh, uh, something that I guess uh, Israel and Egypt have to negotiate and find an acceptable arrangement that will fulfill the mutual requirements and, and the mutual red lines, you know, security on the one hand and respect of the Egyptian sovereignty on the other hand. So I think that this is a, a delicate balance that has to be found among the member states. Thank you. Ibtisam? Uh, thank you. My name is Ibtisam Azim, Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. I have uh, first a uh, few follow ups. Uh, first one regarding your work uh, or coordination with the um, mechanism under cigarette uh, CAG, if you could explain this to us. And the second thing is regarding, I know that, um, and you have said that, uh, and others uh, many times, that uh, trucks numbers are not uh, enough uh, uh, and the, the aid is more complicated. But if you could give us a percentage or something that we can have a better understanding of what you, in general, in average, would need daily and how much percentage of that is allowed, let's say, in uh, the month of June or uh, lately. And then um, another follow-up uh, about the issue of uh, so-called dual, uh, dual usage uh, things. I mean, the Israelis are not allowed, uh, among the few things that they are allowing, there are things um, that they are not allowing under um, the so-called dual uh, usage. Uh, and some of these things are very essential to your work and aid and to people there. So if you get, 
could give us examples. And my uh, latest question, uh, it's, it's, it's a um, big picture question. You worked in many other areas and uh, in war zones. And um, if you compare what you are seeing now in Gaza to other places you worked in, what, how would you describe it? Thank you. Thank you, Ibtisam. Um, so we, we collaborate, of course, with, uh, uh, with the USG CAG uh, uh, operations. Um, colleagues, actually, of their office are sitting next to, to, to me in, in, in my, same, my same office. Um, the, since the very beginning, we said that the, the importance of the mechanisms was about uh, solving the issue of the diversification of items that uh, should enter in order to have a proper humanitarian response and the quantity. So if the mechanism can consolidate um, a reliable system that will reassure all the parties, the Israeli and the Egyptians, about how this, uh, or, you know, the humanitarian nature of this consignment um, and that will allow to increase uh, the overall and arrival of commodities uh, in not only in quantity but also in quality terms. That would be, I think, the success measure for for the mechanism. Um, I think that the UG CAG has focused a lot on building, uh, you know, the, the 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 relations and the trust around. Uh, the, the, the mechanism. The mechanism has been recently uh, activated for Jordan and the Maritime Corridor. Uh, we are expecting it to be imminently also activated, fully activated for the Egyptian side. And, and you know, for us is more than welcome uh, as, as a mechanism uh, in the moment where we will have an increase of delivery of assistance. The percentage of, of entry uh, it's uh, so at times I wonder if I am able and effective in briefing you guys because the major challenge we have had since the very beginning of this operation is that a humanitarian operation is not the result of one action, let's say track entry, it is the combination of multiple levels. So our ability, for example, to measure how much of what we need is intimately linked to the ability that we have to move and to bring in staff, uh, bring in the equipment that that staff needs to operate, and so on and so forth. So the reality is that in these nine months of operation, we have progressively expanded our footprint. We are now, uh, you know, I think there are roughly 70 uh, 70 international that have entered. At the beginning, we were, you know, 20, um, and we have increased all of the, the UN agencies and partners have increased the, the number of national staff. So there has been a, a huge uh, effort to, to move the dial. But the reality is that we are not where we should be. And so for me, telling you exactly what is the percentage of what enters uh, where we should be is 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 very challenging, you know. Now I can tell you that uh, you know uh, the colleagues from Mura were saying that they need 60 trucks of flour um, uh, a day to enter, um, and and you, you look at the numbers of of, of trucks that are entering, uh, we are not there. They have done very well in the past months. I think that the, as I said earlier. The Zikim uh, operation, for example, is working well and and meeting the basic needs of 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 Gazali. Of, of, but there are other parts that we are far away from where we should be. You know, we've been asking for months the possibility to bring uh, educational and recreational material for children. There are, you know, 600,000 children that out, uh, are out of schools. 50% of the population are minors. Um, they deserve to be, you know, taken care of. And Maybe it's not life-saving in strict sense, is that is they don't receive that, they will not die today. But the long-term damages on the social fabric of that situation of children that cannot 
or do not have access to activities uh, every day, or ideally, you know, some resemblance of school, is is uh, is is gigantic, is, is enormous. And we cannot, uh, you know, ju just content ourselves to, you know, counting the, the percentage of the truck, because otherwise it will really skew the, the, the analysis. The other element that we're moving forward progressively is the opening up to material that in the past was not uh, allowed in. I know that the Israeli have been, uh, you know, doing some efforts to uh, expand the, 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 the list of, of material, and there's been a lot of diplomatic and political capital spent to, to advocate for uh, bringing in pipes, uh, bringing in some wash material that, uh, that, um, that is essential to resume some essential services. Um, and, and, and this is something that we, you know, we, we need to keep on advocating. Uh, but the scale of the current level of entry of assistance is, you know, a, a drop in the ocean of what is required. Thank you. Um, and, uh, other questions uh, about uh, the big picture and your experience in other war zones compared mm -hmm. to Gaza? Gaza starts with a unique situation. It's the only place in the world where people cannot find a safe refuge and can leave the front line. So we were talking the other day with some colleagues on security and they say normally you no, know, the procedures we have are conceived to take the mitigation measure that allow us to go toward the front line. Uh, in Gaza, everywhere is a front line. Uh, you know, there is no safe space. Everything is front line. And the fact that civilian population cannot go anywhere to find safety, because even within the safe area, there are bombardments, um, it's, uh, it's, it's the major characteristic and unicity of this situation. And this is why the Secretary General keep on saying we will stay and deliver, because there is no other place in the planet where, you know, if we pull out, what happened to the rest of the population? The population cannot pull out. So the humanitarian community cannot pull out. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel? I uh, thank you for the briefing, Gabriel Elizondo from Al Jazeera English. Uh, you've answered most of my questions. Thank you for all your time. I just have two. I just want to clarify, uh, when Israel orders these quote-unquote evacuations in the last few days, are they at all giving you a heads up and or coordinating in any way, shape, or form? And if they are not, why not? Uh, what is the reason that they're giving you for not? And then the second question is, I'll just ask you to step back a second. I know that Secretary General has said the UN is not leaving Gaza, but my question to you, sir, is how much longer can this go on and how much longer at the current rate of this conflict can the humanitarian community in your role continue uh, given the situation? Thank you, Gabriel. Um, it's... Um, As I said, we don't have options. Um, we, we can't. Uh, there, there is the humanitarian imperatives for, for the way we are, we have operated in, in many other contexts, um, will, will never uh, allow us to say uh, we have to give up. What we have to do is to continue advocating and finding the political support and the diplomatic support to. Uh, reach the place where, by doing this, we're not exposing uh, our colleagues to the risk of their life. Uh, you know, I, I was involved in, 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 in the recovery of the colleagues that have been uh, victim of, of the incidents on the 13th of April. And honestly, uh, we can't, we shouldn't have any of that as it is for the other 270 colleagues that have an aid worker that we lost. So that's where the, the, there is a difficult red line to, to, to walk through. Um, on the heads up for, from IDF, in this specific case, we did not receive. And, and actually, as I said earlier, um, when, when we, we were told later on the day that the, the evacuation order was not involved in the hospital, we told them, yeah, thank you, but it's a bit too late because you should have told them earlier 
Um, I think that the, the you know, I, I'm not a military expert. I guess that, that there are military reasons why they cannot necessarily uh, share information ahead of time. Um, and basically, we, we saw it in, in social media. Um, and so this is something that, uh, again, uh, particularly when it is impacting civilian critical services of, and civilian infrastructure, I think it's very important that we maintain and entertain a dialogue. Um, but this is an ongoing conversation with the Israeli that we will continue to, to have. Thank you. Uh, we're just going to go to the screen, Abdel Hamid, uh, and then Besan, and then Don, and we have to close it. Uh, thank you, Domenico, for uh, the briefing. Uh, my name is Abdel Hamid Sayam from Al Quds Al Arabi. I have a few also questions regarding the situation, and I want to ask you first about UNRWA. If it's still functioning, do you deal with it? Do they have people on the ground? Are they functioning in, in different parts of uh, Gaza? And as, uh, another question about the situation in the refugee camps in the West Bank. I mean, the situation, as far as I know, and first-hand knowledge, there are some now difficulties, some maybe hunger in some of the refugee camps in the West Bank, if you can give us some information about it. And last time I asked you about a child number 30 who died out of famine. Now I heard that child number 40 died of famine. So if you can also... Uh, share some information about it. And I'm not sure if you can tell us more about the Guantanamo of Israel, which is uh, the uh, detention camp of the time uh, between Gaza and Beersheba, uh, and the situation of the DTN is there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abdel Hamid, for the question. So UNRWA is, is, you know, is present. Uh, the sheer number of people that they have, the 13,000 employees that they had before the war, uh, part of them, not all of them, but part of them are really, they reinvented themselves because most of them were teachers, actually. Um, they reinvented themselves and they are part and parcel of the humanitarian operations. Also importantly, UNRWA has a presence, uh, you know, throughout the Gaza Strip, as you maybe know, uh, that is very important because this allows us to you know, peggy back on their structure, infrastructure, when we needed to uh, operate. Give an example. The other day, my, my team went to Gaza City, and they were uh, looking at the number of people that came out from Sujahia. And, of course, the humanitarian mechanism normally goes through an assessment and then start delivering assistance, but we have to mobilize the cluster, the partners, and so on and so forth. And so we discussed with my team, and we decided, okay, the first thing we do is to go through the UNRWA uh, infrastructure to distribute, you know, emergency aid. Now, the initial things, some some items, non-food items, blankets and, and and whatever was was necessary, and some initial food because these people have left with nothing. You know, they need a minimum to to, to uh, be accommodated in in a destroyed uh, uh, schools because that's where they have gone. They moved into destroyed school inside Gaza City from Sujahia. So, so. UNRWA remains a fundamental element of the response. Um, I think also that the humanitarian community has progressively expanded their footprint. We're not where we should be, but because of all the constraints I described. Uh, and I think we should continue to, uh, to make an effort to get there. Thank you for the question on the West Bank. Indeed, I, I didn't cover at all West Bank. Uh, and, and, and the situation in West Bank is critical, not only uh, uh, not only on on the refugee camps. Um, you know, the, the situation in refugee camps is particularly critical because of all the military operations that are happening there. You know, the legal framework of operations in the West Bank is a law enforcement, and what we see is methods and practice that are more closer to warfare. Um, and, and we have seen all the damages uh, to, to the infrastructure inside the camps, <clears throat> including to UNRWA facilities. Um, and that's of greatest concern. But the, the situation in West Bank in general is complicated. As, as you know, the, the economy of West Bank is very much integrated with Israeli. And since the 7th of October, 
a uh, lot of that is is not happening anymore. So not only the resolution of the revenue, but it is also the all the issue of the economic exchange that were happening between Israel and West Bank. And there are you know thousands of of jobs lost, uh, thousands of business opportunity lost. And this situation is really concerning us because it could bring a you know a deterioration of the situation to the point where you could have uh, a serious serious further deterioration in the West Bank. Um, child uh, children uh, dying of anger. As I said earlier, you know, and and we discuss a lot with UNICEF colleagues. The only possibility for us to, to be specific and and scientific in this uh, in reporting this would be to have fully functioning operations. The reality that apart from going to Kamal Adwan and trying to understand what is happening there, which is one, as you know, one of the hospitals where these children are treated in the north, we we do not have that capillary presence that allow us to monitor the entire situation. So again and again and again, we are appealing for having full and unimpeded access to scale up on monitoring operation. Then I will be able to, you know, appropriately uh, answer to your question. I'm sure the UNICEF colleagues are working on this, they are collecting this, but they themselves admit that they do not have the visibility of the entire situation because not everybody can come to an hospital, as you know, unfortunately, given the situation of the hospital. Um, and, the, and, and, and thank you also to remind you the situation of the detentions. I think that you know there has been the, the the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights have have published and, and have done some uh, some studies on it. It's beyond the, the remit of, of OCHA, but for sure is one of the um, very concerning uh, parts of the uh, of the current situation. Considering in particular that no one has uh, has had access to any detention center since the beginning of the war. Um, and that, of course, and so we just get the accounts of those who are liberated and freed and released in, in Gaza. Uh, and those accounts are uh, are scaring and concerning and, and, and really uh, raise a lot of concerns about violation of basic human rights. Thank you. Bissam, and then we'll close it off. Thank you so much, Bissan Abquik with Al Jazeera Arabic. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you only got 35% of the funding that you have uh, requested. Um, just two parts to this question. How uh, would how important would it be to actually get the rest despite all of the other challenges that, ha that have nothing to do with funding, security, and uh, so forth in terms of aid operations in Gaza? And if you don't get the rest of this amount, how would that actually impede your operations uh, in in Gaza and deliver and I mean aid delivery and everything else? So I give a very clear example. I hope to explain this. I said earlier that with the loss of EGH, the European Gaza Hospital, we lost the last CT scan available in Gaza. Some colleagues told me that there is one of the NASA once in a while works, but it, it's not functioning <laughs> every day, apparently. The, if we have to start thinking about re-establishing minimum uh, decent conditions of basic services, like hospitals and health, of course, being a fundamental one, uh, we need to align some equipment like this, CT scans, uh, MRIs and so on and so forth in order to be ready the moment in which the constraints on our system will be lifted to bring them in and start again uh, providing these services. And this is not something that if tomorrow you tell me you can bring it in, we can improvise. It takes, you know, weeks if not months. You know, some of these machinery is very complex, very... Uh, very expensive, and, and, and they need to go through procurement processes that takes that time. So um, for me, is really, we have two elements of it. One is the immediate uh, level of operation that has to be sustained, which I think is primarily what this 35% has been so far. Um, but then we have also the, the rest that we have not been able, and that the rest that we have to be ready to deliver, 
that uh, that will have to be uh, that the way to work on. So the impact will be really in moving the dial on this. Andrea, thank you so much for taking quite a bit of. Uh of, of time, and we really appreciate it. We wish you and the team all the best, and we'll, I know we'll see you back here very soon. Take care. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you all. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.